and as a result, it's uh, it's very it's a very wonderful product. And I would pick. They, they're also very cheap. I mean, I would pay a lot more for mine. Um, the, the Mac. And I, now I have a vested interest here. I do work with Apple. I've been I've worked with Apple for nearly half my adult life, and I get money from them. They give me money in order to give them advice, uh, so I'm not entirely unbiased. But the Macs, the family of Macs, and other parts for Apple, occupy the place in my mind, in my heart, in my soul that religion uh, is occupied in other places. <laughs> We are in the process, you and I, all of us in this room, are in the business of building something that has quality, whatever that means. And whenever I wonder what does it mean, I look at the Mac. I look at my laptop. I look at my iPod. I look at my desktop, my, uh, my uh, new dual processor, Intel-based Mac OS X machine. And say, oh, that's, that's it. I want to build something that is in its domain what this beautiful machine is in its domain. We have these, uh, over the years, we've had these wonderful wars called the Flame Wars uh, on the net. When the net was young, we had all these Flame Wars. People would say, you know, that, that Windows is trash and the Mac is the only operating system. Other people saying, no, Mac is a toy. Windows is the only, you know, Windows is real world and so forth. Now, the, yeah, those Flame Wars, and nobody ever convinced anybody. Nobody ever convinced anybody. But there was a really interesting thing going on. The people on the Mac side of those Flame Wars adored their Macs, whereas people on the Windows side detested Windows. <laughs> Why did they take the position they were taking? Well, because of vested interest. They're deep into it. They learned how to put their elbow on the control key. <laughs> and that, that's how they, they've invested themselves in it, so they've got to be defensive of it, but they hated the thing that they were defending. Well, we love the thing that we were defending. So that's, that's the idea of something that is dense and being which the a big quality of innovation is it can give us something, this is where the margin comes from, something that is uh, dense and meaning. Uh, the differential value proposition that, that Rob shared with us is don't, not buy my product because it's cheaper, but buy mine, it's going to cost you a lot more, but you'll want it anyway, and it will be worth it to you. And it's with a little bit of pain on his elbow and decided to go from there. Uh, failure is a step, uh, not a glitch. Um, it was a little bit later in the conference, but I will put it here that Jorge had a comment about failure. He said, we were, well, we've all been talking about failure but, uh, and saying how good it is, but let's not forget that our organizations do not look nearly so kindly on failure as we do, and they attribute a, 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 a lack of performance uh, to, uh, to any kind of failure. That you're supposed to go from A to B without making a misstep along the way, or somebody, at some level of the organization, a melancholic personality, if you will, is going to mention that that misstep cost him money, he's the bean counter or whatever, uh, and that that wasn't a good thing. So we don't, we're not rewarding failure, we're not in, encouraging failure, uh, we're just talking a good game about it. Uh, and then the videos that Rob showed us started to go off into the very strange territory of organizations, of the way you organize your pile of books, the way you organize your photographs. And people began to extol the virtues of utterly disorganized things. Of, of course I can't find the drawing I was looking for or the picture I was looking for, but look what I stumbled upon in the way to try to look for the thing that I never actually did find. Um, and I think that left everybody in the room cold, but me, I love that. I love that. Maybe I'm just a disorganized person. But I'd like to share a story with you. And it comes from a, a novel by Emil Zola. Zola was a social critic. His novels are bitter and angry, but fascinating and wonderful because the characters are good, and he records the real world in which he has the events take place. And the novel I want to call to your attention is one that's called Au Bonheur des Dames, To the Happiness of Women. It's the story of the world's first department store, the opening of the world's first department store. Now, just between us, the world's first department store was in Paris, uh, and it was opened in the 1870s, and it was called Au Printemps. You've been to Au Printemps. Have you ever been to Paris? Au Printemps? The world's first department store. He has fictionalized it to the extent that the department store here is called Au Bonheur des Dames, uh, and the character called Mouret, 
is a thinly veiled portrait of the man who actually founded uh, the, uh, the world's first department store. Now Zola is mortally offended by a department store because it's putting all of the drapers out of business. And the second character in the story is Denise, who is a draper's daughter, and her father's being put out of business. Without anything else to do, she goes to work for Murray. She falls in love with Murray, but eventually rejects him because he is doing this terrible thing of starting a department store and putting the drapers out of business. Well, that's the story. The scene I want to call to your attention is the night before the opening of Obon Rodinam. They've spent all this time building the building and building the counters, hiring the porters and the sales clerks, one of which is Denise. And Murray, during that night, has everybody in there working until 3 a.m., putting the goods out, putting the maternity dresses here and the children's, uh, the, the infant's clothes here and the children's clothes next to it, uh, in orderly progressions uh, from the pots and pans to the scrub brushes to the, uh, uh, to the soap that you use to, uh, to clean the, uh, the crockery. Uh, and at 4 a.m. they're all done, and at that point he says, no, 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 I was wrong. And he has them scramble everything. So when you go into the store, as in any department store you went to today, nothing is where you expect it to be. So you have to go through everything to get to anything. A stroke of absolute genius. I don't know what it has to do anything, but it's a great story. <laughs> then we 